This is The Ballad or the Bullet by Malcolm X. It was delivered on April 12th, 1964 in Detroit, but he gave the speech several times in different places. Um, and it was exp extraneous? No, exp I forget the word. It is when you kind of speak off the top of your head. So um, Malcolm X didn't have any notes. He didn't have anything written down or anything like that. He just came up and he started speaking. Um, so you have to understand that about Dr. King. Uh, there's going to be more information about his biography later, but um, Malcolm X and Dr. King are very much different in their rhetoric, in their speaking, and what they're saying. Okay, so it's really important to understand um, some of Malcolm X's history and who he was, which um, you will be given the opportunity to learn more about. Essentially, Malcolm X um, didn't really have uh, the education that Dr. King had, uh, Malcolm X, um, I think he dropped out of school when he was in grade school, actually. He spent some time in jail. He uh, got a lot of learning or received a lot of learning um, when he was in prison and when he joined the, um, the um, Muslim Brotherhood. So the Nation of Islam, I'm sorry. So there's a lot of different things about Malcolm X that you have to understand as far as like his rhetoric and what he was saying and how he was speaking. That's going to be a lot different than Dr. King. So I really want to make sure you guys understand that. But The Battle of the Bullet is probably his, I would say his most, uh, I don't know if I want to say interesting speech. Uh, it's, it's interesting how he looked at the world and how he talked about the world. So uh, as I go over the document today, kind of understand that you're dealing with someone who I don't want to say he was angry, but he definitely had some anger inside of him. There were some things going on and there was a lot of mistrust as well. So kind of keep that in mind. All right, let's get moving. All right, I wonder if I can move that. Okay, good. All right, so Mr. Marier, Reverend Clee, Brother Lumix, brothers and sisters and, I, and friends, and I see some enemies. In fact, I think we'd be fooling ourselves if we had an audience this large and didn't realize that there were some enemies present. All right, so normally in rhetoric, you want to bring people in, right? You want to like have people trust you. You want people to say, "Hey, like this is a great place. Thank you for letting me. Ha thank you for letting me come here. Thank you for having me." In Malcolm X's case, he's like, you know, I see some friends, but I also see some people, some enemies, some people who don't like me, right? And I don't like them. Uh, and that level of antagonism is going to continue throughout his entire speech. He understands that uh, there are some people in the audience that he doesn't trust, but he also wants the audience to think that as well. He wants the audience to be skeptical. He wants the audience to be cynical. He wants the audience to not trust um, the, the typical power dynamics. And so when you're reading the speech, he's looking at um, he's looking at rhetoric, he's looking at persuasion far differently than Dr. King did. So the first thing that Malcolm X does he is he talks about his religion. He says here, I'm a Muslim minister the same as they are Christian ministers. So he mentions some Christian ministers up here. And he says, I'm a Muslim minister as the same as they are Christian ministers. I'm a Muslim minister. And I don't believe in fighting today in any one front, but on all fronts. In fact, I'm a black nationalist freedom fighter. What he's saying here is, uh, if he continues, he says, Islam is my religion, but I believe my religion is my personal business. It governs my, it governs my personal life, my personal morals, and my religious philosophy is personal between me and the God whom I believe, just as the religious philosophy of the, these others is between them and the God whom they believe. And this is the best, this is best this way. He says here, you and I uh, will have the differences, blah, 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 He says here, but if we keep our religion at home, keep our religion in the closet, keep our religion between ourselves and our God. Uh, but then when we come here, to, uh, we have a fight that's common to all of us against the enemy who is common to all of us. So there's a lot of things going on here. So th uh, when this speech was given, he had already split from the nation of Islam. So Dr. King, I'm sorry, I'm going to do this a lot. Malcolm X spent some time with the nation of Islam. And at a certain point, he split. And so not right now, Malcolm X is spending a lot of time on his own um, trying to do civil rights, trying to push civil rights movements, right? Uh, but he's still Muslim. And by, at this time, I think he's more of a traditional Muslim than he is part of the Nation of Islam. And, but he doesn't want his religion to factor in into what he's talking about. So we look at um, 
Dr. King, he used his religion quite a bit in his arguments, right? He talked about religious religion a lot. But Michael Max isn't going to talk about religion too much here, or, or matter of fact, at all. There's a couple different reasons why. One, I think that um, Michael Max spent some time in the world. He was a little more secular than Dr. King, so he didn't really need to rely on religion that much um, to back up his points. And also, too, Islam, even back in the 60s, was considered... Um, I don't want to say strange religion, but it wasn't it wasn't accepted um, by most people. And so most Afri most African Americans were Christians at this time, and so they probably looked at Islam with some skepticism. And so in order to connect to people who might not approve of his religion, he he just kind of leaves that out of his discussions. Even though some of his um, his ideology and some of his religious beliefs do factor in into what he's talking about, and we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, which is really fascinating, right? Like we spent so much time with Dr. King and he just talks about religion and religion and keeps going back and forth. Here, um, Michael Max wants to leave that alone. He doesn't want to deal with it at all. All right. So the main part or one of the main parts uh, about the uh, Battle of the Bullet is that he is that Michael Max uh, explains what black, nationali black nationalism is. And he tries to use this text to explain what it is. So let's read that. He says, the political philosophy of black nationalism only means that the black man should control the politics and the politicians in his own community. The time when white people can come in our community and get us to vote for them so that they can be our political leaders and tell us what to do and what not to do is long gone. But the time, by the same token, the time when the same white man, knowing that your eyes are too far open, can send another Negro into the community and get you and me to support him so he can use him to lead us astray, those days are long gone too. The political philosophy political hospital of black nationalism only means that if you and I are going to live in a black community and that's where we're going to live because as soon as you move into one of there as soon as you move out of the black community into the community it's mixed for a period of time but that gone and you're right there all by yourself again we must understand the politics of our community and we must uh, know what politics is supposed to produce we know what po part politics plays in our lives and until we become politically mature we will always be misled, led astray, or deceived and or maneuvered into supporting someone politically who doesn't have the good of our community at heart. So the political philosophy, so the political philosophy of black nationalism only means that we will have to carry on a program, a political program of re-education to open our people's eyes, make us more political conscious, political mature, and then whenever we get ready to cast our ballot, that ballot will be cast for a man of the community who has the good of the community at heart. The economic philosophy of black nationalism only means that we should own and operate and control the economy of our community. You would never find, you can't open up a black store in a white community. White man won't even patronize you. And he's not wrong. He's got sense enough to look out for himself. You, the one who doesn't have sense enough to look out for yourself. Okay, lots of going on there. So let me explain some of that. Okay, so uh, remember back in the um, I've been to the mountaintop speech. Remember back when Dr. King was talking about economic boycotts and how he can use how black people can come together and boycott businesses. Uh, this is the same thing that um, Malcolm X is talking about as well. Malcolm X believes that if black people simply focus on themselves, work together themselves and vote for black people that they trust, then they can uh, they can gain political power. It's very much like what Marx was talking about with the proletariat, right? Um, but it's a little different now because um, African Americans aren't necessarily the only proletariats in society. But um, Malcolm X, just like Martin Luther King, also understands the power of collective working together, collective unity, right? And so black nationalism um, would be that You'd have a group of African Americans in a neighborhood who would come together. They'd find their own candidate for a city council or mayor, and then they would push that person. And of course, that person would be black, and that person would push um, the different kind of agendas and needs of the black community, right? Um, and also, Malcolm X understands that certain uh, Democrats, powerful Democratic leaders, um, back in the '60s would find African-Americans and um, I wouldn't say use them, but they would find African-Americans and push um, 
of African Americans to vote for a certain candidate. So, for example, uh, maybe the Democrats would find an African American not from my same neighborhood. That African American would then uh, run for office, right? But then uh, Malcolm X says in this document that uh, those people aren't going to have the best interests uh, of African Americans at heart because they're not um, quote unquote one of us, right? So black nationalism is very much similar to white nationalism in the fact that we care about ourselves. So black people should only work at black businesses, vote for black candidates, push for political change through for black people. It's all about the black experience and black community and and no one else. The only difference between black nationalism and white nationalism is power dynamics. Um, white people in this country have an enormous amount of privilege and power, right? Not just um, political power, but economic power uh, as well as far as, and also institutionalized um, power dynamics. Black people don't have those. And so one would argue, and I think Ma Malcolm X would argue, that black people are doing this as a, as a form of self-defense, right? That black people should come together and unify simply because um, they need to, to protect themselves. And this is very much different than what Dr. King was talking about, right? Uh, Dr. King believed in integration. He believed that African Americans should spend their time trying to integrate into the communities. And that's everything that he wanted, right? Even though um, Dr. King understood the same thing that, Mark, that Malcolm X understood, Dr. King believed that integration was the way to go. Malcolm X does not believe in integration at all. Um, you could do your own research here, but um, Malcolm X went so far as to have meetings with the Ku Klux Klan to organize a certain form of segregation in certain neighborhoods in the South. It was actually kind of strange. His meeting with the white with the Ku Klux Klan is actually a weird um, factoid. Uh, but Malcolm X really believed that African Americans should have their own lands, their own businesses, their own economics, their own politics, and they should not deal with white people. Uh, a lot of this is from the Nation of Islam, um, because the Nation of Islam was extremely racist uh, as, as far as not trusting white people. There's a lot going on with the Nation of Islam that I can't spend too much time talking about right now. Um, you do need to understand that the Nation of Islam was, is, is completely different than um, traditional Islam. It's not the same. And so again, research this, look this up on your own. Um, but Malcolm X's time in the Nation of Islam, plus his experience as an African-American in the United States, has made uh, Malcolm X extremely skeptical of white people. Uh, he does not like them. He does not trust them. He does not think that white people have the best interests of African-Americans at all. So really get that. But there's no but there. Um, but I don't want you to think that Malcolm X is the antithesis of Dr. King. I don't want you to think that Dr. King and Malcolm X were complete opposites. They weren't. And we'll talk way more about that. All right, let's keep going. So he says here, uh, the political, the economic philosophy of black nationalism only means that we have to become involved in a program of re-education to educate our people into the importance of knowing that when you spend your dollar out of the community in which you live, the community in which you spend your money becomes richer and richer. The community uh, out which you take your money becomes poorer and poorer. And because these Negroes have been misled, misguided, are breaking their necks to take their money and spend it with the man, the man is becoming richer and richer and you're becoming poorer and poorer. And then what happens? The community in which you live becomes a slum, it becomes a ghetto. So interesting ideas. So first he says, and these Negroes who have been misled breaking their backs. He um, doesn't use inclusive language. Sometimes Malcolm X would say we, but most times he says you or, or, or there. He says it as if he's not part of the problem, which I find really interesting. Um, but then he says here too, he says the man, um, that is a euphemism for uh, white people. Uh, it, I would say it's a neg it's a it would it would probably be a negative um, a negative connotation. You wouldn't want to, I I don't know it's just like the man right. So I, I hope that's something that people still say. Maybe I don't know. Uh, but he puts the blame uh, of economic suffering on poor people on African Americans. He says because you spend your money in the wrong place, you become poor and poor, and where you live becomes a slum. It becomes a ghetto. So I think Dr. King would argue 
that social institutional problems have allowed African Americans to stay poor. But here, Malcolm X is saying, you African Americans, you Black people are making bad decisions. This is your fault. You should start protecting yourselves. You should be working to, to strengthen your community, which is interesting. This is really fascinating. So let's keep going. He says here, uh, right here, uh, let me get a drink of water. I'm sorry. So we're trapped, double trapped, triple trapped. And anywhere we go, we find that we are trapped. And every kind of solution that someone comes up with is just another trap. But the political and economic philosophy of black nationalism, the economic philosophy of black nationalism shows our people the importance of setting up these little stores and developing them and expanding them into large operations. World War didn't start out big as they are today. They started out with uh, a dime store and expanded and expanded and then expanded into today. They're all over the country and all over the world and they get to some of everybody's money. Now, and he says General Motors the same way. They didn't start out like this today. It started out as a little rat race type operation and expanded and expanded until today, where it is right now. And you and I have to make a start and the best place to start, right, in the community where we live. Uh, so our people not only have to be re-educated to the importance of supporting black business, but the black man himself has to be made aware of the importance of going into business. Uh, really interesting here. He says Woolworth and General Motors, right? And he's talking about how these companies are small and then they got big, so black people can also do the same. That's actually a fallacy. And you're gonna see some fallacious arguments from Malcolm X. Uh, I'm not saying that Malcolm X is using all fallacies. He's definitely using a lot of emotional fallacies. You'll see that. But, sorry, um, but here, a black, pers a black person can't just go from poor to rich in like a couple like small moves, right? And like Woolworth and General Motors are companies. Like they have a business plan and they have people working to get that business plan initiated. So what Michael Mix is trying to say is, is that if black people just do what they did, start small and they'll get bigger, they'll become rich. That's no proof of that, right? So you're not going to see a lot of logical arguments here from Malcolm X, especially right here. There's going to be some other places where there's definitely some logic involved. But this, I would argue, is a fallacy. Like, you can't just say that you're going to start small and then become rich. It's not, there's no proof of that. And if African Americans are poor and they see that Malcolm X is saying they can become rich, They'll want to do that. So he's actually manipulating them oddly in an emotional way. Now, I'm not saying that Malcolm X is doing that on purpose, but I think that's his rhetorical strategy. Uh, he likes to be um, gregarious in his speeches. He likes to um, say things that don't have a lot of facts behind it. And that's kind of very dangerous, especially when we get later on in the text. Um, he needs to have more responsibility for what he's saying, and he really doesn't here, which is kind of interesting. All right, let's continue here. Uh, let's see here. So he says here, the government uh, has failed us. You can't deny that. Really powerful language, right? Um, Martin Luther King, uh, let's see, this was written in 64. Yeah, so in 64, the Civil Rights uh, Bill is already passed. Uh, and the Voting Rights Act is getting ready to be passed, or people are working on it right now. This, I think this speech is given before Malcolm X goes to Selma and speaks, I think. Um, but Martin Luther King is trying to work in the government to make uh, the Black experience better, right? King is, like, trying to pass legislation, and he's working, and stuff like that. But Malcolm X is like, the government has failed us. You can't deny that. Anytime you live in the 20th century, 1964, and you walk around here singing, we shall overcome, the government has failed us. This is part of what's wrong with you. Uh, you do too much singing. Today, it's time to stop singing and start swinging. All right, so this is actually where some of the violent rhetoric starts coming up. First, um, Malcolm X is definitely talking directly to King here. Like, we should overcome and singing. Like, Ma uh, Martin Luther King's movement, there's a lot of singing. Uh, it's a lot based in the church, okay? And, and Malcolm X is saying, you singing too much. Uh, you need to stop singing and start swinging, right? And so, again, you're going to start seeing a lot of violent, violent imagery, a lot of violent rhetoric here. 
Uh, you can't sing up on some freedom, but you can swing up on some freedom. Cassius Clay can sing, but singing didn't help him to become the heavyweight champion of the world. Swinging helped him become the heavyweight champion of the world. This government has failed us. The government itself has failed us. And the white liberals who have been posing as our friends has failed us. So a lot of strong language here, right? He's saying the government has failed us. He's saying that white liberals have failed us. He's saying, hey, Dr. King, stop singing so much, right? Like, we need to be more powerful, more aggressive. So here's the key question for this document. Does Malcolm X think people should actually be violent, or is he simply using violence as a rhetorical technique? He has violent language, right? Is he actually saying we should physically fight? Or is he saying, hey, be tougher. This is just rhetoric. I'm just speaking, right? Does he really mean it? Is it literal? Or is he being uh, figurative when he says things that are violent? That's going to be a question that we are going to ask ourselves over and over in this document. All right, so he says here, black nationalism is a self-help philosophy. Uh, he says here, you can stay right in your church where you are and still take um, black nationalism as your philosophy. You can stay any kind of civic organization that you belong to and still may take black nationalism as your philosophy. So he's actually saying, hey, people who support King, you can also do black nationalism. You can be an atheist and still take black nationalism as your philosophy. It's a philosophy that eliminates the necessity for division and argument. Because if you are black, you should be thinking black. If you are black, you're not thinking black at this late date. Well, I'm sorry for you. Once you change your philosophy, you change your thought pattern. Once you change your thought pattern, you change your attitude. Once you change your attitude, it takes your behavior pattern, it changes your behavior pattern, and then you go on into some action. As long as you guys sit down philosophy, remember, Dr. King is having sit-ins right now, right? And he's using, Dr. King's using nonviolent direct action, right? And Malcolm X says, as long as you guys sit down philosophy, you'll have a sit down thought pattern. And as long as you think that old sit down thought, you'll be in some kind of sit down action. They'll have you sitting everywhere. It's not so good to refer to what you're doing as a sit in, see? Uh, that right there castrates you. Very interesting, castration means uh, to cut your male body parts off, right? And so, again, very strong language here. Right there, it brings you down. What goes with it? Think of the uh, the image of something sitting. An old woman can sit. An old man can sit. A chump can sit. A coward can sit. Anything can sit. Well, you and I have been sitting long enough, and it's time today for us to start some standing and some fighting to back that up, right? Very aggressive, far different than what Mark, that Martin Luther King was talking about, right? Martin Luther King was using nonviolent direct action as a rhetorical tool. So this is really important. Dr. King did sit-ins and marches and did nonviolent direct action as a rhetorical tool, right? Dr. King would let cops beat them and arrest them in order for Dr. For Dr. King and his supporters to have the moral high ground by not fighting back. Dr. King was showing that they were better than the people that they're attacking. But what happens when you do that is that you get people like Malcolm X, who says that you're a chump, that you're weak, that you're not a man, right? And like, that's really tough to deal with if you're a young black person and you have to choose which civil rights program you want to be a part of, which one sounds sexier, right? Which one sounds uh, more dynamic, right? Of course, Malcolm X does, but it's not effective. Black people can't start going out in the street and, and reckon. They can't do that, right? Because if you do that, the cops are going to say, look, those Negroes are being violent. We told you those Negroes are violent. Let's arrest them. Let's put them in jail. Let's beat them up. Let's kill them. That's like they're a violent people, right? And Mal Dr. King knew that, and that's why he didn't use violence, right? So part of this is like, part of it is like Malcolm X is able to say this stuff, right? But does he understand exactly what he's arguing against, right? Does he actually think violence is better than what Dr. King is doing? Even though what Dr. King is doing is very measured, is very educated, right? It's, 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 some, it's some deep questions about that. All right, let's keep going. 
All right. So he says here, when we look like when we, when we look uh, at other parts of the earth upon which we live, we find that black, brown, yet red, and yellow people in Africa and Asia are gaining their independence. This is actually something that Dr. King said as well. He talked about how other countries are getting their independence, like Africa and Asia. Uh, I had a student once write a paper about this, and it's kind of fascinating what Dr. King and Malcolm X were witnessing in 1964 about their independence. Um, let's keep going. And then he says here, so this is a really interesting part. He says here, uh, and in 1964, it looks like it might be the year of the ballot or the bullet. What does it look like? What does it look like it might be the ballot? Why does it look like it might be a ballot bullet? Because Negroes have listened to the trickery and the lies and the false promises of the white man now for too long. And they're fed up. They've become disenchanted. They've become disillusioned. They've become dissatisfied. And all this was built up frustrations in the black community that makes the black community without throughout America today, more explosive than all the atomic bombs the Russians can ever invent. He says, whenever you got a racial power keg sitting in your lap, you're in more trouble than if you had a power keg sitting in your lap. And he also says here, um, let's see here, he made, he said here, I'm sorry, he says here, and you see all of that now, he tricked you and you marching down to Washington. You, yes, you had you marching back and forth between the feet of a dead man named Lincoln and another dead man named George Washington singing We Shall Overcome. This is, uh, Malcolm X is talking about the uh, I Have a Dream speech and the March on Washington. He's making, he's saying how it's not effective. He said he made a chimp out of you, he made a fool out of you, he made you think you were going somewhere and you end up going nowhere between Lincoln and Washington. So today, our people are disillusioned, they've become disenchanted. They've become dissatisfied, and in their frustrations, they want action. And in 1964, you'll see this young black man, this new generation, asking for the ballot or the bullet. That Uncle Tom action is outdated. The young generation don't want to hear another thing about the odds are against us. What do we care about odds? A couple things here. Um, the ballot or the bullet comes up, right? Either He's saying either we get the ballot or we get the bullet. And I think what he's trying to say is that African Americans either get the right to vote and we get the chance, the opportunities to vote properly in our societies, or there's going to be violence, right? The ballot or the bullet. He never outright says that African Americans are going to result to actual violence. Malcolm X never says that outright, but how else can you interpret this, right? And again, what could the ballot act mean? What could what else could a bullet mean? It's not like you know, it's not a bulletin board or anything like that. It's obvious what he's trying to say. He's uh, equating racial power to a power keg, right? He says it's dangerous, right? And he's saying how the watch on Washington didn't work. He's saying how uh, non direct violent non violent direct action is not working. And then he says here. Uh, he call, he says that the old Uncle Tom action is outdated. Uh, Uncle Tom is a refer, reference to Uncle Tom's cabin. It's about um, Uncle Tom is a, a derogatory statement that you would call African American who doesn't understand that black and doesn't understand the black movement. Uh, if you call some, if you call a black person Uncle Tom, it's a it's a really big insult. So first. Don't ever call a black person that. And also, too, uh, Malcolm X has no problem calling other people Uncle Toms, which is, uh, again, um, a pretty, pretty strong language. All right. So let's look at some of the more violent imagery and violent, um, violent words that Malcolm X is using here. So he says here. When this country here was first being founded, there were 13 colonies. The whites were colonized. They were fed up with this taxation without representation. So some of them stood up and said, liberty or death. Uh, though I went to a white school over here in Mason, uh, Mason, Michigan, the white man made the mistake of letting me read his history books. I'm going to skip a little bit here. He says, uh, liberty or death was what brought about the freedom of whites in this country from the English. They didn't care about the odds why they faced the wrath of the entire British Empire. And in those days, they used to say that the British Empire was so vast and so powerful when the sun, the sun would never set on them. This is how big it was. Yet these 13 little scrawny states, tired of taxation without representation, tired of being exploited, and oppressed and degraded, told the British Empire liberty or death. And here you have 22 million African-American people today catching more hell than Patrick Henry ever saw. And I'm here to tell you, in case you don't know it, that you got a new generation of black people in this country who don't care 
uh, anything whatsoever about the odds. They don't want to hear you old Uncle Tom handkerchief heads <laughs> talking about the odds. No, this is a new generation. They're going to draft these young black men and send them over to Korea or South Vietnam to face 800 million Chinese. If you're not afraid of those odds, you shouldn't be afraid of these odds. So here's a question. If you look at that paragraph, what is Malcolm X trying to say? Is he actually saying that black people should take up arms against the white power structure in 1964 and have a violent revolution? Or is he saying, hey, if 13 colonies can overthrow the British Empire, then African Americans can also get their civil rights through difficult means. Malcolm X never says, and that's a problem because he's allowing the reader to decide what he's saying. That can be very dangerous. Is he actually saying be violent? If someone read this and misconstrued his meaning, that could be bad, right? And so again, the battle of the bullet, it's a really interesting question. What exactly is Malcolm X trying to say here? All right, keep going, but I'm gonna stop. It is very fascinating Malcolm X's views versus Dr. King's views, right? I mean, these are two, I would say, well-educated men. Uh, both of them have lived a lot of life, even though they're both under the age of 40. Um, both of them are trying to push for civil rights in a very interesting way. Um, but they have a, two different ideas about how that should be done. We're going to talk at the end about why that happened and why people like to um, compare these two men, even though some of the comparisons aren't apt. It's just not fair to compare them. Uh, so he says here, kind of this. Nope. He says here, I'm a not Republican, nor a Democrat, nor an American, and got citizen enough to know it. I'm one of the 22 million black victims of the Democrats, one of the 22 million black victims of the Republicans, and one of the 22 black victims of Americanism. And when I speak, I don't speak as a Democrat or Republican, nor American. I speak as a victim of America's so-called democracy. You and I have never seen democracy. All we've seen is hypocrisy. It's kind of interesting how sometimes Malcolm X was kind of either proclaim or embrace some aspects of America. But here he says, I am not an American. He, he was an American citizen. Um, so it's interesting here how he just refuses to even connect. And the idea of Americanism is really fascinating. Uh, I don't have, I'm gonna have another video, I think, where I kind of explain some of, some of these uh, deeper aspects about uh, King and Malcolm X. But America was founded on slavery. Without slavery, America would not, um, have been able financially to uh, become as rich as it had it has become or is now like right? slavery uh, the riches of slavery uh, are still being shown throughout today and, and it's very fascinating how he says Americanism like Malcolm X just knew things like he had a connection to ideas in a way that um, some people have a hard time with he was intelligent but not highly educated which is fascinating because he's he's almost like he has an amazing toolbox um full of amazing tools and he only knows how to use a few of them he doesn't know how to use all of them but he has some great insights and the idea that african americans never had democracy is actually i would say true like african americans never had true democracy in the united states in 1964 like they just didn't no way uh they, like african americans never enjoyed that in 1960 up to 1964 and it's really fascinating how he understands that and that's, I think, the connection. I think that's how people really get interested in Malcolm X is because he's saying some hard truths. He's saying things that Dr. King would never say. Uh, and it's kind of fascinating how those hard truths kind of come out. All right, let's keep going. Um, oh, a little tidbit. Uh, if you understand a guy named Mitt Romney, uh, Malcolm X is talking about uh, Mitt Romney's father here. It's kind of cool. I guess it's kind of neat. Uh, so he has some, he talks about some politics stuff here that's kind of dense. Um, I'll be interested to see what you guys think about this a little bit more, but it takes a little bit, you have to research what was going on in the political dynamics. But he's, he's talking about how the Democrats use the African American vote to achieve their goals, right? So Democrats will go get African Americans to vote for them and then leave and they wouldn't help African Americans after the vote. And he does say down here, he says, 
Anytime you throw your weight behind the political party that controls two thirds of the government and that the party can't keep the promises that they made to you during election time and you're dumb enough to walk around continuing to identify yourself with that party, you're not only a chump, you're a traitor to your race. That is some strong language, right? He's not mincing words. He's being really tough on African Americans in this. All right, so there's a lot more political stuff. Um, this stuff is interesting, I think, but I don't really have a whole bunch to say about it. He's just trying to explain the political dynamics. But he does say here, he says, they'll lynch you in Texas as quickly as they'll lynch you in Mississippi. Only in Texas, they lynch you with a Texas accent. In Mississippi, they lynch you with a Mississippi accent. And the first thing the cracker does when he comes to power, he takes all the Negro leaders and invites them for coffee to show that he's all right. And those Uncle Toms can't pass up the coffee. They come away from the coffee table telling you and me that this man is all right because he's from the South. And he and since he's from the South, he can deal with the South. Look at the logic that they're um, using. What about Eastland? He's from the South making the president. He can. He can. If Johnson is a good man for, uh, from the cause, he's from Texas. And being from Texas will enable him to deal with the South. Eastland can uh, deal with the South better than Johnson. Oh, I say you've been misled. You've, you've been had. You've been took. So a lot of inside baseball stuff. He's talking about President Johnson. Um, he's talking about the election coming up. He's also talking about, uh, he mentions lynching, which I think is interesting. I would love to read more about what Malcolm X thought about lynching. But we already talked about lynching, right? And so again, um, he Malcolm X understands the dangers that African Americans face in the South. And when he mentions the South, he, he, you see how it's in capital letters? It's, a, it's like a proper noun. He means like the South is the states that, um, it's a long story. You have to understand a lot of stuff about American history and politics. But the South uh, were the states that fought uh, for the Confederacy during the Civil War. The, the, South, the Southern states wanted to keep slavery. Once the Civil War was over, the Southern states did everything they could to keep African Americans down. Um, they made it so African Americans didn't even have a right to vote. Uh, you have to remember that 1964 is only 100 years from the end of the Civil War. Uh, so it's very, it's kind of interesting how. Uh, the times haven't changed that much, right? And so, um, again, Malcolm X understands these things intrinsically, but I think he spends a lot too much time on the politics of this. But um, if you're um, interested in this, it'd be a great paper to write. All right, so let's keep going now. There's only a couple of places I really want to go with this. Uh, it says here, uh, the same thing happened in Algeria and Africa. They didn't have anything but a rifle. The French had all these highly mechanized instruments of warfare, but they put some guerrilla action on, blah, blah, blah. And so again, Malcolm X is saying, hey, we might be a small force, but if we work together, we can achieve greatness, which is which is interesting. Um, but at this point, I think Malcolm X has said pretty much all the points he needs. But he does say this. This is an interesting paragraph I want to read. Let me take a drink of water. Let me read it. I mean, notice how strong the language is when I read this. He says, Uncle Sam, Uncle Sam is a euphemism for the United States. Uncle Sam still has the audacity or the nerve to stand up and represent himself as the leader of the free world. Not only is he a crook, he's a hypocrite. Here he is standing up in front of other people. Uncle Sam, with the blood of your and mine, mothers and fathers on his hands, with the blood dripping down his jaws, like a blade jawed wolf, and still got the nerve to point his finger at other countries. You can't even get civil rights legislation, and this man has got the nerve to stand up and talk about South Africa, or talk about Nazi Germany, or talk about Durstland. Why? No more days like these. So I say in my conclusion that the only way we're going to solve it, we've got to unite in unity and harmony, and black nationalism is the key. How we go overcome the tendency to be at each other's throats that always exists in our neighborhoods, and the reason this tendency exists, the strategy of the white man has always been to divide and conquer. He keeps us divided in order to conquer us. He tells you um, for separation, you for integration to keep us fighting with each other. No, I'm not for separation and you're for integration. What you and I is for freedom, only you think that integration would let you get your freedom. I think separation would get me freedom. We both got the same objective. We got different ways of getting it. Uh, so he's talking directly to Dr. King here, I think. He's saying, hey, you for integration, I'm for separation, right? And he says, we don't disagree that much. We just have a different idea about how to get these things done. Uh, so kind of interesting. And again, really strong language here. I mean, when he says here, uh, this line here, 
uh, Uncle Sam with the blood of your and my mothers and fathers in his hands. Like, that's just so powerful. He's saying, like, how can the United States uh, talk about uh, civil rights and talk about other countries not having proper civil rights when African Americans here are suffering, right? He's also talking about unity. He's talking about working together. There's some Marxism in there. There's a, there's a weird little salad of ideas that I find pretty fascinating. All right. Uh, he says here, it will be the battle of the bullet. It'll be living your death. And if you're not ready to pay the price, don't use the word freedom in your vocabulary. So I went over a big chunk of the speech, but I left a lot out uh, on purpose. And I hope that you guys, by reading this in detail, will see and uh, some more things I might have missed. Um, but also, the experience of reading this is um, very powerful. There's also uh, some audio of him uh, giving this speech, and I'll make sure that I uh, give you the audio so you can actually hear him giving the speech as well, which I think is powerful as well. Uh, our next speech is going to be uh, Malcolm X's last speech. It's called After the Bombing. <laughs> 